Hey Church on the Move West family, my name's Chuck and I'm one of the pastors here at the church. And I would just like to say welcome. Whether it's your first time ever, or if you're joining our growing online community, we are just honored to call you family. And if it is your first time ever, we'd like to send you a cup of coffee from Starbucks. And the way that you can receive that is by texting the word WEST to 23101. Hey, let's get to the message. And here's what I hope when you hear it. I hope that it better equips you to find the purpose and plan that God has for your life. And then in turn, you can go out to the world that you live in and work in, and you can help introduce people to the real Jesus. Let's get to the message. Well, we are in a season of fasting. Maybe you're just hopping in, and maybe this is your first Sunday in a while, and uh, last Monday, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about this thing, the spiritual discipline of fasting. And last Monday, we all jumped in for a 12-day fast, so we're kind of in the middle of it. I'm not sure if what condition you're in right now. I'm hungry. Um, I forgot how much I miss food. <laughs> I, I'm like, I love food. I drive by Buffalo Wild Wings, and I'm like, I miss you, Buffalo Wild Wings. <laughs> I promise I'll be back. <laughs> oh, the thing, the, the cheese and the bacon. <laughs> Sorry, that was a sinful thought. That was a lustful, lustful moment. <laughs> but honestly, I, I, you know, I've, I've done this before, but man, I forgot how hard it was. I, I told you fasting is not fun. Fasting is painful. Fasting is self-inflicted conflict. And, and man, it's, it's, it's been that. And it's, it's hard. It's difficult. But it's such a beautiful process that God is doing something significant in the lives of individuals. And one of the things that I forgot to tell you, and and I apologize for this, is that when you make a determination to really go towards God and you step into a season of a spiritual discipline like this, a lot of times we put a target on our back for the enemy. We, We see this in the Gospels where Jesus steps into the wilderness and he says that he's led there by the Spirit of God. Much like I feel like the Spirit of God has led us into this season. And he fasted for 40 days. And he did food, water. I mean, it was an extreme, such respect for what he did. But it talks about how the enemy shows up in his life, tempts him, tries to confuse him, tries to deceive him, tries to lead him. Because the enemy, when we make a determination to turn and head towards God, we're going to meet resistance because that's the last thing that the enemy of our life wants to see. He doesn't want us closer to God. He doesn't want us more confident in who God is. He doesn't want us more confident in who God's created us to be. So he's going to do everything in his power to derail us, to distract us, to confuse us, to get us off of this path of stepping into a deeper, more intimate relationship with Jesus that out of that comes a greater sense of spiritual health in us. He just doesn't want that. And so I don't know what you've experienced this week. There's been a couple of times I've had to apologize to my wife because I've been moody, I've been short, I've been snappy. It's not been a perfect week. It's been a hard week. But in the midst of this, in the midst of the pain, God, God's doing something in me, and I believe God's doing something in you. And so I hope that you're getting a lot out of this season. I don't know if you've ever seen one of these Jim Fell videos? Have you ever, you've been scrolling, you're not supposed to be on social media this week, but for those of you that a week ago, you would scroll through and and you ever see the the guy on the machine that is using the machine the wrong way? And it's really funny. If you haven't, go look it up when, after this 12 days. And it's, it's, they're going through the motions, but they're not getting any benefit out of the workout. And and here's what I fear for us is that maybe there's some of us that through this fast would go through the motions and not get the benefit out of this season, that we might waste these 12 days. We might waste the pain. We're trying to become someone. We're, We're trying to become a better version of who God's created us to be. We're trying to become more Christ like. Remember early in the series, we talked about the truth that if we can't say no to ourselves, we can't say yes to Jesus. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 16 that to follow me, to be my disciple, 
You're going to have to come to the place of maturity to where you can deny yourself, pick up your cross, pick up the thing that I ask you to pick up, pick up the thing that will crucify and put to death your broken and flawed humanity, your flesh, and follow me. There's going to be seasons, there's going to be moments, there's going to be crossroads where we come to a place and what we want and what God wants don't align. They're not congruent. There's an incongruency there. And there's going to be a real battle for us of where do we say yes to? Do we say yes to ourselves? Do we say yes to our desires? Yes to what we want? Or do we say no to what we want so that we can say yes to Jesus? The hope is, is that we're becoming the type of people that can say no to ourselves and say yes to Jesus. And that's the muscle that we're exercising. We're exercising this muscle of self-denial. As we step into this, we recognize that fasting is painful, that, that fasting is uncomfortable, that fasting is difficult. But I want to tell you this, that pain isn't the point. It, it's not the point just to be uncomfortable. It's, it's not enough just to be in pain. There's a lot of people that have experienced pain and not gotten anything out of it. There, there's a lot of people that have experienced suffering but haven't grown through it. In fact, as they've experienced this suffering, they've become what I would call a victim. Now, I, I want to tell you this, that it's very different that you can be victimized and not become a victim. You can have something done to you and against you, and you can be victimized, but you don't have to become an eternal victim. You don't have to become helpless. And when you become a victim, there's this mentality of, I am helpless I am incapable of doing anything. The entire world is against me. I'm not sure God is for me. There's this victim mentality that now I am helpless to just suffer whatever the world throws my way. But as we develop a deeper relationship with God, we understand that we're not a victim. Yes, we were victimized. Yes, we went through something painful. But with my relationship with God, my pain and my victimization can be redeemed to turn it into victory for me and for other people in my life. And pain isn't the point. If we're going to go through this season and not waste this fast, not waste these 12 days, not waste the pain of this moment and the discomfort of this moment, there's a few thoughts that I want to just toss out this morning. And the first is that if we're not going to waste this season, instead of just feeling the pain, we have to find the purpose in the pain. There's a purpose There's a deeper purpose that sometimes we have to go beyond the surface of what's happening, of what we're feeling, of what's going on. And we have to dig in and allow God and the Spirit of God to cause us to begin to find the purpose in the pain that we're suffering. Romans chapter 5 says this. It's very similar to James 1 that we've been looking at over the last couple of weeks. But Paul writes in Romans 5, he says, we can rejoice. There can be an excitement in our life when we run into problems. When we run into trials, for we know that these problems and these trials, they help us develop endurance. And this endurance, listen to this, develops a strength of character. And this character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. So there's something, there's a deeper purpose of building our endurance, building our faith, strengthening our character. I would love for the people that know me to say things about me that there's a strength of character in me. I I was raised with a dad that taught me a man is only as good as his word. That there's a value on being a person of character, being a person of integrity, And in these seasons of pain, instead of just focusing on the pain, we need to find the purpose. And here's the purpose, I think, in this season. Is that the purpose of the pain is helping us become who God intended us to be. It's helping us become who God created us to be simply by revealing obstacles that are in the way of us becoming. 
in this season, the purpose is not to just be in pain, but the purpose is for the pain to reveal the weaknesses in our life and the issues in our life that are actually stopping us and preventing us from being the person that God created you to be. You were created with potential and purpose and destiny and all of these things. But as you stepped into the world, you stepped into a broken world. And you've been through some things. You've had some dirt thrown in your face. You've been spit on. You've been wounded. You've been hurt. You've been through some tough experiences. You've made some mistakes in and of your own humanity. And there are some things that we've picked up along the way, some weights that we're carrying that are actually weighing us down and stopping us from forward progress, from moving in to becoming the person that God created us to be. And so what we've done is we've stepped into a season of self-inflicted trouble, of self-inflicted problems. Fasting, that's what it is. Not someone from outside doing something to me or the economy crash. It's, it's us saying we see the value in seasons of discomfort. We see the value in seasons of pressure and stress. And so we're going to put some stress and some pressure on ourselves to see what God will reveal so that we can strengthen our character. Remember a couple of weeks ago, I used this analogy of practice and how a coach will put so much pressure on their players during practice to try to get them to crack under that pressure so that they'll know how to handle the real moments of the real game scenario. That's what we're in right now is kind of a practice season of putting pressure on ourselves. And the reason we're doing that is because of this truth. Crisis reveals character. Crisis reveals character. There are things in these seasons, there are things in moments of crisis that God can reveal about your character. A few years ago, uh, my father-in-law had several trees blow down in his, the pasture in his front yard. And so we gathered up the kids and myself and my wife, and we went up and stayed for about a week with, with my father-in-law. And we just, we love being there. It's our time away. And I get to be in the country, and I get to be in the trees, and I just get to do country stuff, and it's, it's wonderful. And so I grabbed a chainsaw, went down to the pasture, started cutting up some trees. And the girls were down, they're dragging brush, we're piling it up, we're going to build a bonfire, we're going to do some crazy stuff. And, and as we're doing that, my father-in-law wanted to come down and help, and so he drove the truck down, and it had just rained within the past week. And so he hit one of those places and felt that feeling that you never want to feel when you're driving through a pasture. And it's that little slip, it's that little bottom fallout. And he stuck the truck, couldn't go forward, couldn't go back, mud slinging everywhere. The girls thought it was the greatest thing ever. And it's like, what what do we do now? We didn't want to pull another truck down. We didn't want to get a tractor in the pasture because we didn't want to stuck two or three vehicles and have this whole crazy mess. And so there was a tree relatively close but a pretty good distance away and I I said I think if we can get enough chain we can wrap the chain around the truck and we can wrap the chain around the tree and we can use the tree to pull the truck out so we ran up to the house we searched through the garage we found all the chains that we could we looked at all the other trucks and all the other places where chains were kept and we grabbed a ton of chain and went down to the pasture and we daisy chained all of these chains together so we got chain hooked on chain hooked on chain and I mean, we wrapped it around the truck, and over here we wrapped the tree or, or, around the, the chain around the tree, and we hooked this chain to this chain. And so we had like a long connection here. And right in the middle at these, the connection point, we put what's called a chain hoist. And I don't know if you know what a chain hoist is, but chain hoist is something that is just a little round mechanism. It's got gears inside, and it's got chains on either side, and you can use it to pull, and, and it tightens, and it basically its purpose is to make give us the ability to lift something really heavy and it makes it pretty easy. And so I thought we can hook this chain hoist in the middle and we can use this chain hoist to pull the truck out of the mud. And so that's what we did. We hooked it up, got it all hooked up and we started pulling and the chain starts to lift off the ground and there started to be some tension and some stress and we're we're watching the truck and we're pulling and we're pulling and we're pulling and it took just a, a long process to do this. But the truck kind of began to, to rock a little bit and move a little bit. And as the chain began to tighten, there was more and more stress, more and more tension, more and more pressure until we reached that point that you never want to reach. And that was the breaking point of the chain exploding into pieces because there was so much stress and strain on the chain. And when that happens, the chain is under so much pressure that things explode and, and things can go through windshields. You can take off a finger 
You can, you can hurt a child. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of bad things. So we're ducking, we're covering, you know, kids are diving out of the way. It's like a war zone, but thankfully no one's hurt. No windshields were broken in the process, but this chain has exploded. What, what, what happened? Crisis revealed character. Because looking at the chain in the garage, we examined it, we, we looked at it, we surveyed it, it, and it looked great. It looked strong. It looked healthy. It looked prepared for the task in front of it. But it wasn't until we removed it from its place of comfort and put the chain under pressure and put the chain in a crisis that its character, its weakness was revealed. And so we kind of looked around and gathered ourselves and said, okay, let's... And so we went to the chain, we found the weakness, we found the broken link, we fixed it, we mended it, we restored it, we hooked it back up and used that very chain to pull the truck out of the mud. It's a beautiful example of the process that we're in. We're putting ourselves under pressure so that our character is revealed because that's the purpose of the pain, to find the weaknesses to find the things that are stopping you from accomplishing the mission. There was a weakness in that chain that prevented it from accomplishing its task. And it wasn't until the weakness was identified that we could fix the weakness and then use the chain for its purpose. Many people would have thrown the chain away. Many people would have discarded the chain. But the chain still has purpose even though it has a weakness. It just needs to be mended. It needs someone to know how to care for that brokenness in its life and to restore it and to redeem it so that it can still be used for a greater purpose. You and I right now are identifying some weaknesses. Maybe you were a little snappy this week with your spouse like I was. That's That's a weakness. That's an incongruence in my character that doesn't reflect the character of Christ when I'm under pressure. Maybe you were aggravated or frustrated at work or maybe there were other things that you were dealing with in a real way this week as you fasted, as you denied yourself, as you put yourself under a crisis, under pressure. And maybe there were weaknesses that God is showing you, would you pay attention to this? Because this is the thing that's going to stop you from becoming the person I've created you to be. This is the thing that's going to be an obstacle for you. It's going to be a hindrance for you to be a great witness, to be a great example, to be the father that you were intended to be, to be the the mother or the wife or the spouse that you were intended to be, to be whatever it is that God's put in your life. And I think a great prayer this week would be the prayer of Psalms 139, that the psalmist says, God, would you search me? And would you know me in an intimate way? And God, as, as you look through my life, would you, would you find and show me anything that doesn't reflect your character? The, the psalmist says it this way, show me anything that's offensive towards you. Anything that's incongruent with your character. That anything that's, that's a flaw within me. I, I recognize that I'm human. I recognize that I don't see everything that's going on in in my life. The Bible says that my heart is deceitfully wicked at times. And so God, would you search me? Would you know me? And God, would you show me these things that are broken? And I love the last thing is God, would you, it's my way of saying it, but God, would you grow me? God doesn't just show you the deficiencies and the weaknesses in your life. God helps grow you through those. When you partner, I love what Romans says. He says he's given us the spirit of God to one be an expression of his love for us, but the spirit is a helper. The spirit is a guide. The the Holy Spirit is a partner in this journey of identifying. The the, the Bible says in the, the gospels that the spirit of God convicts us of our sin. And so as he convicts us of our sin, he's pointing out these things that are incongruent with God's character and saying, can I, can I work on that? Can we address that? Can we change this about you? Can we adjust this in your attitude? Hey, you think this way and you have this perspective and and can we adjust that? Can we change that? Can we move this? And the spirit of God is helping us. And so what a powerful prayer this week to pray as we finish the the rest of this fast is saying, God, would would you search me? Would you know me? Would you show me these things that are broken? And God, would you grow me beyond that? I think part of what God's wanting to show us and reveal to us and part of the weaknesses that he's wanting to reveal in our life is maybe the sin in our life. And and I would 
put sin in one of two categories. The first would be sin that I commit. It, it's, it's I'm guilty of. And there's a lot of things attached to that when I, when I commit a sin. There's guilt, there's shame. There are consequences for our decisions. The Bible says that God's not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that's what he's going to reap. So if we're living a sinful life, we're sowing and we're reaping what we're sowing. There's consequences. There's just natural consequences for our decisions. We make this decision to sin. Sin means miss the mark. We miss the mark on the life God intends us to live. We miss the mark on the way God wants us to act. We we miss the mark on the way we talk to somebody. We miss the mark on keeping this or, or whatever it is. And I think you could take this kind of sin and maybe talk about it three ways. That there's what we would call cultural sin. And there are things that culturally across the board, we know these things are wrong. They're, they're just wrong. If we were to ask most anyone in, in our culture, is murder wrong? They would say, yeah, that, that's wrong. That's, that's a sin. That's, that misses the mark of the life that we're supposed to live. And all of us would probably have that. There's probably very few people. And if they answer that incorrectly, you might call the police. I don't know. Um, but most everybody is like, yeah, that's, that's wrong. And, and maybe that's something that's in your past. I don't know. I don't know everybody here. I don't know the depths of, of what you've experienced or what you've been through. And maybe you carry some shame from that or some guilt from that or some feelings from that. Maybe you were in a situation and you fought a war or I know so many guys that go through that process and they come back and they carry something from those seasons and they, they feel all this guilt and shame. And maybe there's something in that that God's saying, hey, I want to I wanna surface that and I want to deal with that and I don't want you to be a prisoner to that anymore. I don't want that to be the thing that makes you think you can't live a life being used by God. Then there's a, a second type of sin that we commit that would be what I would call Christian sin. And these are sins that, you know, culturally are acceptable, but as a Christian, we know in our relationship with God, as we read the Bible, these things are wrong. These things miss the mark. Sex outside of marriage might be one of those things. I mean, if you look around, it's pretty culturally acceptable. Yeah, why wouldn't you? I mean, live life. Have, Yeah. But when we get into a relationship with God, we begin to understand God says, hey, that's, that's best and that's healthiest and that's right when it's in the context of marriage. And anything outside of that marriage relationship is sin. It misses the mark. And then there's a third kind of sin that I really think is unique that is probably what most people, things are being revealed over these 12 days. And that's what I would call Blind spots. There are things that we don't see. We, there's things that we don't recognize. There's, there's things, for, for example, maybe it's, it's not a big deal, but, but maybe you've recognized this week how much you reach for your phone and how much you still instinctively want to hit that social media app because there's something on the inside of you that depends on Maybe some approval from people liking what you say on Facebook, and you're, you're looking for that. And maybe there's something God's saying, hey, you're missing the mark on where you're getting your approval from. Maybe there's something in an attitude or something that's hidden, and, and you've never really thought about it even as a sin. But God's saying, hey, this, this, is, this doesn't reflect my character. And I think it's those things that are probably what God is revealing because those are the deep hidden things that really are not revealed until you put yourself under pressure and crisis reveals your character. And I think that ought to be the thing that we're looking for is, God, what are the blind spots in me? What are the things that I don't see? What are the things that I haven't paid attention to? What are the things that I haven't recognized? And maybe God's trying to reveal some of those things because those things can become an obstacle that keeps you from becoming who God wants you to be. But there's a whole second category of sin that I think it's really important that we address. And it's not the sin that you commit, but it's the sin that's committed against you. A lot of us carry the weight of that sin. Not because we have to, but because we carry the consequences. We, call, we, we carry the pain. We carry the scars. We carry the wounds of sin that's been committed against us. And some of us don't even realize the fact that we're a prisoner to the pain of that past moment or that past hurt. 
There are things that are said. There are things that are done. There are sin that's committed against you. And people, even though they didn't do it, even though they didn't deserve it, even though they weren't responsible for it, they still carry the shame and the guilt of it. We heard that story just just a few moments ago that someone was convinced that everything that happened to you was your fault. And there was a shame and a guilt that was associated with something that she didn't do. And I think what God wants to do in these moments is reveal some of those hurts and some of those wounds and some of those pains of the sin that's been committed against you. Because just like the sin that you commit, these consequences and these hurts and these wounds can still be an obstacle that keeps you from being the person that God created you to be. And maybe God's revealing something in that. God's revealing something in those things and saying, hey, would you, would you let me heal that? Would you let me walk you through a process of forgiving that person? Would you let me free you from the shame and the guilt of that? Would you let me show you who you really are, that you're not the person that deserved what happened to you? that you weren't guilty of anything, that you weren't responsible for anything, that that was an act of evil that was done against you. And can I free you from that? And what a beautiful relationship with God to where we get into a season of pressure or fasting and God's just revealing things. He's revealing things that are broken within us, that are hurt within us, that are sin within us, anything that's an obstacle to us becoming who God wants us to be. And as we deal with all of these things, whether it's sin we've committed, sin that's been committed against us, what we're doing is we're developing a type of character that's becoming like Christ. We're becoming the type of person that can embrace surrender. We're becoming the type of person that can say yes to Jesus because I've been able to say no to myself. I I can say no to the hurts of my past. I can say no to the things that are stopping me and convincing me that God could never use me. God could never love me. God could never change me. God would never, God, we're saying no to those things so that we can say yes to God. And ultimately we're, we're, we're trying to become the type of person that in the greatest moments of our stress and the greatest moments of problems and troubles in our life, We can be like Jesus and we can say yes to God. There's a moment early in the Gospels where we see Jesus fasting and practicing this discipline of self-denial. And he's he's saying no to himself and there's temptation. I believe that season, as, as it was significant and there were things accomplished that the old covenant and the, the prophets you know predicted would happen. I believe that moment was a season of exercising his muscle of self-denial. It was a season of preparation so that when he stepped into the moment where all of eternity was held in the balance, he had the strength of character to say no to himself and say yes to God. We find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and it's approaching quickly the time for him to go to the cross. And I love the conversation and the inside, behind-the-scenes look that we get to have. It talks about the pressure that he was feeling, the stress that he was on him. And I'm not exactly even sure the right words to use to describe this moment, but words like anxiety and fear and stress and pressure and worry come to mind. I don't know if those are the right words. It's hard to think about Jesus, the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the the Word became flesh, the Word that was in the beginning, the Word that seen the, the beginning from the end. It's hard to imagine him stressed and emotional and weak, but yet we find him in this place where he is definitely carrying something heavy. He's in a moment of crisis, and the crisis is revealing his character. And he's honest before God and says, God, I... Um, I think I'm changing my mind here. I know we had this whole plan. I know we had this thing that I was going to go to the cross and I'm going to carry the sin of the world and I've never sinned, but I'm going to become sin so that those who have sinned can become righteous. And I, I, I get that plan and it, it sounded good on paper, but now that I'm here in the moment, I'm not sure I want to do this anymore. There's a weight to this. There's a pressure to this. 
And Jesus told God how he felt. He shared his emotions. He shared his, his hesitations. He shared his doubts. And he said, can, can, here, here's what I want. Could, could we back this thing up, slow this thing down, and could, could we find another way? I mean, Jesus, the Son of God, is having this moment. Can, can, we, can we change the plan? Is there a way to accomplish what we need to accomplish without me doing what I'm about to do? Think about the significance of this conversation. The, the Bible clearly says that Jesus, his life wasn't taken. It says that he willingly gave his life. So he, at any moment, can back out of this. He's not forced. He's not obligated. And, and here he is at this moment of crisis saying, I'm not sure I'm going to do this. He told God how he felt. He told God what he wanted. But at the end, his character is revealed and he comes to the place where he says, I don't like this. I don't want this, but not my will, but your will be done. What a remarkable act of surrender. And here's the thing is that his act of surrender to God released the power of God. His ability to say no to himself and to his will and to say yes to God's will release God's power not only in his life to resurrect him back from the dead, but it released a power that set humanity free, that the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is life. And what a power that was released by that moment of surrender. And here's what we learn from Jesus in that moment is that when we become the type of person that's built this muscle of self-denial, our surrender to God releases the power of God in our life. When we surrender our sin and, and we surrender and we come to God and say, I'm, I've made some mistakes. We release the power of God to work in that part of our life. When, when we come wounded and carrying the consequences of other people's sin that they've done to us, and we say, God, I, I surrender to you. I, I don't want you to touch this part of my life. I don't, I don't want you to even know. I, I don't even feel like that thing probably disqualifies me from even being in your presence and from you even loving me or being able to use me. But God, I'm, I'm going to surrender to this idea that if I let you touch that part of my life, maybe you can heal me. Maybe you can set me free. And the surrender to God releases the power of God to do in you what you never thought was possible. And the freedom that you thought was for everybody else, you start to discover is for you too. That God never intended you to live as a prisoner of your sin or a slave to the past of what they did to you. Like you can be free from that. And as we're in this season, we're going through the moments of God revealing these things. And maybe right now in this moment, God's revealing things and you're, you're remembering they did this, they said this, they lied about this. And God's just revealing that to say, hey, that's something, that's a weakness that I, I, I want to I fix, I want to I heal, I want to mend I would encourage us to become like Peter. I was reminded of the Last Supper. And it says that Jesus takes off his outer robe and he puts a towel around his waist. And he begins to wash the disciples' feet. And he gets to Peter and Peter is like, you're the son of God. You're the Messiah. You're the king of kings and Lord. You're not washing my feet. Like, like they're really gross. They're disgusting. Uh, you're, you're not touching that part of my life. And Jesus makes a statement. He said, if you don't allow me to touch that part of your life, that you don't want me to touch it, Peter, all that means is that you don't belong to me. You don't have a relationship with me. And I love Peter's response. Listen to what Peter says. He says, then, then not just my feet, but my hands, my head, my entire body. In other words, I, I surrender all 
to you. Take, take care of it all. And listen, if we're honest, there's those places in our life that if we're real, they're, they're off limits to people. They're off limits to your spouse. They're off limits to your best friend and they're off limits to God. You've not allowed God to get into that space and into that place because it hurts so bad. It's so shameful. It's so guilty. It's so disgusting. And you've thought, if I can just shove that to the side and forget about it, God, you can have all of this, but you can't have this. And maybe God is just saying, that's the thing that I want because that's the thing that's stopping you from living the life of freedom I've created you for. That's the thing that's stopping you from having the confidence that I created you to live with. That's the thing that's stopping you from being all that I want for you. Would you trust me with that? We, we sang this earlier. You're worthy of it all. What a powerful moment. You're worthy of it all. It's easy to sing to a degree you're worthy of it all when we don't mean you're worthy of it all. He's not just worthy of our praise. He's worthy of the brokenness in our life too. He's trustworthy. You can trust him with those things. You can trust him with those places. You can trust him with those issues. And he'll delicately and lovingly, like we did with the chain that exploded into pieces, we mended it and we used it for its intended purpose. As we're going through this season, I don't want us to waste the pain of the fast. And we need to find the deeper purpose of God revealing some things that he's wanting to fix so that he can continue to use us for what we were intended to do. Father, we thank you today. You're working in our lives. You're you're working in our heart. You're revealing some things in our character. There's some, maybe some sin that's weighing us down and keeping us from becoming the person you created us to be and it's we're carrying a a condemnation and a shame and a guilt and and you want to free us from that there's some of us that are carrying the hurt of what others did to us and the sin that was committed against us and you're wanting to touch those places in our life You're wanting to strengthen and heal and mend. As as we're in this place, I just want to ask, every head's bowed, every eye's closed. This is very personal. This is a very intimate moment between you and God. But I just feel as I was speaking specifically about the sin that has been committed against you, and the wounds that that's left, that maybe there were some individuals here that were immediately reminded of something, or maybe you weren't even reminded of it, but because you live with the pain of it every day. And maybe for you, this is a moment where God's put his finger on that place in your life because he wants to bring you to a place of freedom. He doesn't want to want you to live in the prison of that pain any longer. But he wants you to find how he can bring a purpose, a redemptive purpose out of that pain. God didn't do that to you. You didn't deserve it. But God can heal you of it and free you from it if you're here and that's maybe something that you're saying yeah I I can relate to that I can identify that I want God I'm going to say he's worthy and trustworthy of having access to that part of my life do you just slip your hand up and say hey that's me thank you thank you thank you thank you wow tons of hands all across the room Wow. 
Wow. You know, right now, people are praying for you, praying with you. And I I just want to say this. You don't have to live with the shame of what they did any longer. You, You don't have to carry the weight of what they did any longer. God has seen your tears. He's heard the questions of why me? And today, I think he's just simply saying, hey, you're free. I'm going to work. I'm going to touch that part of your life. And I'm going to speak life into you. Whatever it looks like, I, I just want to know, I want you to know that some ways in your corner and as a church staff, as a church team, as leaders in this house, if there's a way that we can help, if it's listening and giving you a safe place to just say, hey, this is what happened. And this is what I've lived with. If we can just listen and be a safe place for you to share openly what happened, we, we can do that. If there's help getting connected to counseling to help you walk through a, a process of healing, if there's anything that we can do, we are here to help. Father, you've seen these hands, and more importantly, God, you see the heart and the wounds that we're dealing with. And I just pray that you would touch every heart, every mind, every person that responded with the power of the Spirit of God. And as they've surrendered to say, yeah, God, would you touch that? I pray that it would release the power of God that some of them need to forgive. Some need a touch from you in a significant way. But God, I know you're capable and I know you're able and I know your desire is for them to be free of the pain of their past. So I just pray that you would release them We honor you today. I thank you for your healing power that's working in the lives of people to free them. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Once again, we're so honored that you chose to join us today and listen to this message. If any point during the message you felt the nudge from the Holy Spirit to make a decision, whatever that is, we want to walk with you through it. At Church on the Move, we realize how important our relationship with God is. Also, we realize how important it is that we have a relationship with each other. So we want to be in that part of the journey with you. So if you need prayer, someone to talk to, you can text WEST to 23101, and one of our prayer team will be glad to pray with you or visit with you. If you can sense our mission to introduce people to the real Jesus, and you'd like to partner with us in the giving of your tithes and offering, you can do that by texting the word GIVE to 23101 and then follow the prompts. Hey, and don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, and then go ahead and follow us on Facebook. That way you can keep up to date on all the things we have going on at Church on the Move West. Hey, we typically do a blessing at the close of our services, and I want to do that today. It's out of number six, verses 24 through 26. I'm going to read it to you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Blessings.